powered by Sports Interaction, Canada Sportsbook. Want to bet? Then get in on the action at Sports Interaction. The boys of summer are back on the diamond and March Madness is on deck. Bet pregame, live in play, or on one of our many prop bets. Sports Interaction makes it easy to deposit, play, and cash out. Head to sportsinteraction.com slash sdpn or in Ontario, download the app now using the QR code at the bottom of the screen. 19 plus, please play responsibly. All right, Oilers fans, we are back. How you doing, Zach? I'm doing really good. Well, besides the shootout loss, but I've said it before. Shootout losses, they they don't hit the same. Honestly, this is a really weird game. I'm sure we're going to get into all that and stuff, but yeah, wow. no. I'm doing good personally. That was about as happy as I think I could be from a loss. Like, you know, not feeling like I'm, there's nothing I'm particularly mad about. Maybe the start in the first period, but I'm, the we'll, way this we'll game started, that. right? Uh-huh. The way this game started, we would have been a lot angrier if that continued on. But hey, you know what? Things turned itself around. The Oilers, uh, unfortunately, dropped this one in the shootout. But they get one point out of this game against Detroit. So recapping this game first off. Yeah, let's just let's just start with the first period because, man, the the Oilers, when they first started, things were doing all right. Nurse had that one shot that just rang off the post. First shot attempt of the game right off the bar, right? You're like, okay, it's going to be a good night. I know Jack and Louie had it in their heads. Oh, it's going to be a reverse. So I'm like, guys, shut up. You jinxes. Just leave it. (laughs) But yeah, no, that was the that was first of two posts. Costin also hit the post later in the period. A uh, really yeah. strong game from Costin. But yeah, no, that they came out of the jump, say pretty hot. Yanmark on line two was a, a fail from the start. Like yeah, he, Yanmark was just not working with anyone. It, it, I'm glad that he found a little bit more success when he got demoted down to like the fourth line or whatever. Yeah, but... yeah, he he's an effective fourth liner. He's a strong defensive player, five on five, but he just doesn't have the puck skills. He's bringing back memories of Alex Chase on every time Leon or Kane would make a play to him, the play would just die. Like it was immediately the end of that uh, pressure in the offensive zone right yanmark does not work up there so and another thing we're going to get into back into but the re- the right wing who should be up there is uh seems like he's ready to come back and uh we need to figure out what's going on with that because i feel like a conspiracy theorist but the way we're all like we got to figure out all these theories about what's going on but yeah we'll stick to the game for now yeah it our, was our group really chat good. our group chat <laughs> is buzzing is let you know let you guys in on a little secret like our group chat for a game over edmonton <sighs> There's yeah. some there's some things going on in there, and the, uh, it's a little bit conspiracy theorist. The theories were up were coming out of my ass today. I <laughs> I was writing two thousand word essays on why Kyler or why just Pooley wasn't put on waivers two days ago, and what's going on, and why he wasn't on waivers today, and if he doesn't go on waivers tomorrow by noon. Like, Yamo's been healthy since Sunday. There's shenanigans going on. They have a healthy player on long-term injured reserve, and he's just sitting there. He's flying around by all accounts, smoking people in practice. The guy's clearly ready to go. They're not taking him off LTIR, and uh, they're not waving Jesse. So if he's not waved tomorrow, uh, the only thing in my head, there has to be a trade coming. I heard someone say today, oh, they're waiting to see if Costin's healthy. Well, Costin played one of his best games as an oiler today. Yeah, well, the the weird thing about Costin was that his first penalty, right? The the weird sort of nick, either it was a toe pick or just something along the the rim of the back of that net. He fell. Mm, the, pen- and just, the penalty, yeah. The penalty, yeah. Sorry, he he just grabbed on to a guy a little bit, and that that was immediately called for a trip. Yeah. That was when things started to go downhill. It's a little weak of a call but also like what what are you doing you know what i mean i'm sure it was probably just a reflex when he was falling he just reached out and grabbed something or stuck his hand out but yeah you can't be doing that obviously and one thing i did notice tonight and i'm gonna let you jump in a second big absence tonight vincent de harnay yeah. not in the lineup first night uh back at 12 and 6 in a while and boy was his absence felt on the penalty kill right detroit yeah. goes two for two on the power play and it like on the second goal detroit scored for example uh brett kulak with like I don't know what he was doing. It was like he just froze to try and block the shot. He didn't go down. He kind of just stayed where he was. There was no pressure on the Detroit player, and they just zing it right far side on Campbell. Now, Campbell, 
this was shades of like October Jack Campbell, one of his weakest games as an oil. This was not a good performance. Sorry, I'll let you. Yeah, jump well, in I mean, we'll get into Campbell's game because I think that was a big part of this game. But uh, you're right. When when things got a little bit rough, like we missed Vinny. Uh, he not only brings that physical factor, he clears the oh, yeah. front of the net. Just a tall presence right and yeah. we haven't played 11 or we haven't played 12 and 6 in a long time the others are are kind of known now for 11 and 7 oh, yeah. so that that departure it it was a big one but you know what like by and by i i don't really think the defense had that bad of a night it's hard to say when you lose uh, the game yeah. and it's four against but honestly i, I mean, pin some of that on a couple other people maybe uh, one. yeah like the goal uh <laughs> Okay, like, did the, any of the defensemen have a great night? To me, it wasn't no. Darnell Nurse's best game by a long shot. Not necessarily in terms of one specific play. To me, it was more in the off. I've, I haven't really made this critique this year, but in the offensive end of the ice, he was had probably, in the first two periods, 12 chances right in the slot, and he was just missing the net wide, like, not completing passes, right? It just seemed like his brain was elsewhere on those plays, and that was getting to be really frustrating early on. He cleaned it up later in the game, but also, he did end up playing 25 minutes tonight. I don't like seeing Tyson Berry at 22 minutes and Cody Cece over 21 minutes. Like, that's why the 11 and 7 works so much, so well is because the Oilers have Nurse, who is a top pairing defenseman, whether you like him or not. You have Bouchard and Broberg, who are really good and can handle kind of those middle pairing minutes. And then you have a bunch of guys who can be effective, but they're effective in like depth roles, right? They have a bunch mm -hmm. of effective depth defensemen. That's why that seven defensemen works so well, because you can distribute the minutes, uh, all the extra minutes to someone else. And you, everyone kind of plays in their role. That's why, you know, everyone wants to get another defenseman, push everyone down into their role. But tonight, I think part of the reason that it was felt and why Detroit, it was such a high scoring game, even though Detroit didn't necessarily generate that many chances, was that Edmonton's defense was kind of playing above their head. They definitely picked it up. Like in the third period, this, I don't want, but I don't want to undersell. Like this was a phenomenal Oilers performance. Like they played mm -hmm. really well. If they get average goaltending, they win this game 4-2. Uh, I think yeah. Detroit by the end of the game, end of regulation had two expected goals edmonton had over four expected goals like this was on jack campbell yeah like that's that's the big one and i really like the way that uh eric in chat brought it out uh campbell before and after shot 15 a tale of two goalies yeah you got the pre-christmas jack campbell and then afterwards by the end of the game that that was an amazing performance a lot of frost crease sort of big robberies uh yeah, yeah this jack campbell's inconsistency continues to be a bit of a storyline and we mm -hmm. we thought we were kind of beyond that there was a period of time when i think the oilers fans would have been happy with both goalies starting you know you, you throw in skinner he's an all-star you throw mm -hmm. in campbell he's been playing a little bit better than an all-star oh, campbell was on a nine game winning streak coming into this game so i think campbell through his last his play has earned the benefit of the doubt in this game like you can have a stinker I'm sure on Friday, to me, I would go back to Skinner just because it was such a bad game. But I have no problem against Colorado, I believe, on Sunday, going back to Campbell. Um, mm -hmm. he, he's earned the right to have a stinker like this. I know he's had a bunch early in the year, but that we got to move on from that, right? Like, he put yeah. on a, a stretch of really solid goaltending. Um, he's allowed to have a game like this as much as it sucks, as much as, you know, you would hope that he doesn't. We all we all know that it, it is a possibility when you're starting Campbell, right? So right. for it to be one in every ten games, it's fine. And the, the thing bad. with the Oilers is they have the offense to carry themselves to at least get a point. Like the fact that yeah. they got a point out of this game. Like if you look, what were the final shots in the game? I think for, uh, for a while Detroit had like 15 shots. Shots, uh, uh, shots in the end were 46 to 23. Yeah. But you're right. One of the big storylines that going into the overtime. 74 shot attempts by the Oilers to 28 by mm -hmm. Detroit. Like they were blocking not, a lot of shots. The Oilers on the deserve to win a meter are over 80%. Like that's why I'm yeah. not upset with this performance, right? Chances are the Oilers maybe score another power play goal. They the Detroit was really good at getting sticks in lanes. They were putting a lot of effort defensively early on. They were blocking a lot of the shots. Ryan Nugent Hopkins phenomenal performance, 3 points, 2 goals early on. He's an awesome finisher with 97. One yeah. thing I will say on the power play it was a little bit frustrating for me. Um, 
the reason why Connor's been scoring so many goals, at least early on or up until this point in the season, is because he see uh, I heard someone brought up the stat on Twitter and I can't remember who, but he had increased his number of shots that he'd been taking on the power play this season. Mm-hmm. It seems like in the last, you know, five games, maybe since the all-star break, there's a number of times I'm like, Connor, come on, you just gotta shoot. shoot. Please just, you have such a phenomenal shot. Like you saw in a shootout attempt, right? Just like the yeah. absolute perfect puck limits. There's the odd time you just want Connor to shoot. They were, there's a couple times it looks like they were trying to pass it into the back of the net, maybe with Connor and Hyman. Again, that's like a really nitpicky because he does have more points than literally anybody else by a mile. But there's just, you feel like there's just, if he did shoot certain pucks, it, it would go in. But he's trying to be unselfish, dish it around. And, it, yeah. It's also a, almost like a pattern or multiple waves, right? Where you've been you've been hearing like, okay, Connor is a very pass first guy, and this season he starts ripping it. He starts just taking the shots from different points, and then when you start getting a little bit of a reputation, like, hey, he might get seventy goals mm-hmm. this year. Like, heck, McDavid is just on a heater. He's scoring way more than anyone else in the league. Maybe that's time when McDavid thinks to himself, no one's going to expect the pass now. Yeah. And if you start going back and forth between them, I mean, hockey players are are habitual, right? Mm-hmm. They're not they're not thinking at that exact moment what their next move is going to be. They just kind of go by habit. Maybe he's starting to regress back into like you mentioned his original unselfish play, just pass first. Yeah. And it it worked. I mean, the Nuge goals <laughs> Some yeah. of those were beautiful passes from McDavid. And uh, speaking of Ryan Nugent Hopkins, he's now on 63 points in the season. And that flipped over is going to be our like counter tonight. Okay, uh, if yeah. we can get to 36 for both Campbell and Ryan Nugent Hopkins for his 63rd point this well, season, just Ryan that'd be Nugent great. Hopkins tonight and not Jack Campbell. But yeah, no, I just want to say what's up to Loom, Loomsis, Mickinator, Eric, Eric Tanner, obviously. Uh, Lindsay, MGD, thanks for joining us again tonight. Wise Kyle, yeah, my Wi Fi or my like Shaw crapped out right before we started, uh, went to start this broadcast. So I ended up having to watch like overtime and stuff on my phone, and I wasn't even sure if my computer was going to work. Thank God I got it to start, but yeah, no, I was a little flustered coming into the show. I wasn't wasn't thinking straight. So, so yeah, We're here. I'm, I'm exactly Game- happy that I got here. And- what not, game but... over we we get it done i mean <laughs> how many how many game over broadcasts have we had technical problems right yeah, exactly <laughs> exactly exactly we got 42 people watching but we only got eight likes come on guys let's hit that 36 let's get it going we got a ton of stuff to talk about we're going to continue to talk about the game and then of course as is tradition we are going to have some trade deadline discussion because i'm um, it just itching to talk about it itching My man's to cooking. talk about it my He's god i up spend a storm. all day just thinking about it fantasizing listening to podcasts about it and uh when i get on here i just gotta release all that information so yeah it's even like like today i find like i'm watching the game i'm watching the game but in the first period for example there's a play Connor mcdavid it's early on right first or second shift of the game the nuge hyman mcdavid line comes out they're flying they're looking fantastic cycling getting pucks on net right all of a sudden passes back to the cody cc at the blue line just bobbles the puck like a bozo goes back and just kills the entire zone thing. And I'm like, I understand why Connor asked for a puck moving defenseman. You know what I mean? Like imagine yeah. that was Eric Carlson. Imagine just for a second. There were, there were a shocking amount of Twitter posts going, you know what? If this was Eric Carlson on the Oilers, it would already be a six, two game. If it was mm-hmm. Chitrin on the, on the Oilers, it would be a four, two game. Like it's, we're waiting. You know, yeah. Ken Holland is known for his patience, but we're we're kind of done now. Like Oilers Twitter and Oilers fans in general want to see a move. And mm-hmm. to be honest, the market, other than two big names, it's been pretty stagnant, right? Like where a lot of names are still yeah. waiting until the trade deadline. Uh, it's one of the few times that I think where I've seen just not a lot of trades happening, but pending like yeah we've seen chicken gavrikov guys that are just like they're not playing anymore yeah yeah absolutely. <laughs> they're they're gonna get traded yeah but absolutely we're just Let's, not doing it yet we, yeah absolutely and we'll get into all that more in like like 10 minutes or so but i feel bad everyone comes here to talk about the game we gotta break down the game and, and if it was up to me i would do two hours straight of just eric carlson to the oilers and why it makes sense 
but we got to talk about the game. That's what we're paid for. But yeah, the first the the uh, Red Wings scored. I think it was four goals and fourteen shots. Right, that absolutely yeah. is unacceptable. Like I, I'm I'm being a little light on Jack Campbell because of his recent stretch of play, but tonight was unacceptable. This is a team with you know top seven, top eight team aspirations. They're cup contender. They are positioning themselves going to the trade deadline as well as possible. So every point just in, in this final stretch of eight, eight, now seven games is just so, so, so important because Holland is going to make a decision based on that. If the others go on a stretch where they lose, you know, five out of seven or whatever, it'll change as, as much as I don't like it. It will change uh, what he does at the deadline. Right. So they need to win every single game. They got two tough games coming up back to back here. So they really need to get a turnaround since they've come back from the break. It's play has been pretty sloppy. There's been a lot of missed passes. It ha- they haven't been as cohesive as a, of a unit. Uh, Deharnay was sick tonight. So we're hoping that he can get back in. I thought Bouchard tonight was excellent. Uh, but this year, there was actually a play that I wanted to point out. So on Detroit's second goal, right? That's the one where Sider threw it from the corner. It mm-hmm. kind of banked in off Campbell. Like, we we can all agree that was a horrible goal to give up, correct? Yeah. Like, here's the thing. It, it's a good topic of discussion because, like you mentioned, Campbell, he let in four tonight. We talked a little bit before the show actually started. Mm-hmm. I don't know how many I would actually pin on him. Uh, I, I know what your dude. answer. No, no, no. I know what your answer is because we we were talking before the show started. Yeah. But I'm gonna I'm gonna say let's do a little exercise. Mm-hmm. We'll go goal by goal for the Red Wings, and yes yeah. or no, give me a thumbs up, thumbs down. All right, Larkin power play goal first. Goal. Larkin. Uh, yeah, Larkin power play goal. You know what? That's on Campbell. That one's on Campbell. Hundred percent. It's tough because you're in a position where, yeah, you may be expecting a pass. You might be trying to get ready for it, but that means you're cheating. cheating. Exactly. You're cheating against the post. And if you're not flush to it, guys like Dylan Larkin, I mean, (laughs) guys like unrestricted free agent coming up, Dylan Larkin, uh, he's going to make pretty nice bank bank afterwards. I want to set some of the, uh, before you get back into it, I just want to say what's up to some of the Red Wings fans in the chat because it's nice that they're joining us and they're also being super nice in chat. Julian Giannotti, Thomas Schwint, uh, everyone, yeah, what's up from Detroit? They're saying McDavid is must-see TV and they always stay up to watch Edmonton games. So happy you're joining us here. Uh, Sider is really impressive, really physical, played way better than I expected against McDavid. So awesome player. Congrats you have him. But yeah, Dennis, you're talking about the, the first goal. Sorry. Yeah, no, I, I think we're both in agreement on that one. Yeah. Campbell's got to have it. So what about the second goal, then, where Sider threw it from the corner in off Campbell? This one's a little bit tougher for me personally, because it, it looks like, yes, he's cheating a little bit, but at the same time, it's off of Broberg. It might have had two bounces. It definitely went off of Broberg's skate. It's still, you you want that. To be to, me, st- to be a save, but when any me, goal dicey. from an angle like that, when you're an NHL goalie, you got to be covering your posts. You can't be cheating to one side. You got to have the holes covered up, right? It's not like it went went off Broberg and like it's not like a Ryan Tipper made a complete like misdirection. Like if Campbell's in position in the old RVH or on the post, it just hits him in the chest. He was down. You could see his pad. Like they, they looked leaky. He. he Okay, his lateral movement is much better than it was earlier in the season, but I think that's something that he kind of struggles with from time to time. And I think he's, I don't know necessarily know how to word it. I don't want to say he can't find his post and he can't track the puck because I don't necessarily think it's that blatant, but there's just certain times where he's not in a position that he should be as quick as possible. And I think that's where he was caught on that side of goal. And it seemed like that was fixed when he changed his equipment, right? When he changed his equipment out, he started getting into better positions. Yeah. Now, you know, he's starting to cheat a little bit more again. And some of those big diving saves, they're they are dramatic. They're awesome to see. They're absolutely blows up Roger's place. But if you're if you're Euler, an Oiler fan, you don't want to see that happen a lot, mm-hmm. right? You want him to be square to the shooter, able to take a lot of these shots right into the chest, like you said. Yeah, MGD says, I still think he should seal the post better. And that's exactly it. I think both goals, if he was just sealing the post better and where he was supposed to be prior to the shot or the 
whatever that was. And I guess you could say that, oh, he didn't expect that to happen. But when you're an NHL goalie, shots come up. We've seen Leon score from below the goal line, right? Like, yeah. shots come from everywhere. Yeah, and that's a And floater. when the, when the like Michigan a, can exist and stuff like that, yeah, you know, you got to be prepared. And that's, to me, just two goals that you can't let in. So the third goal that I said, this is the one where there's a little bit of perfect. debate for sure. If we're pointing out for the least, or the most acceptable one in my eyes is this one. This is Fabry, correct? Yep, Fabry um, yeah. bounces one in. Just, it, it was on the power play again another power play goal and, and at some point like your it, your save percentage is going to be lower on the power play it was still uncontested it was still a shot from pretty far out like to me i said okay that's like a fine one like did, again detroit did have two expected goals this game and but on the broadcast this was the goal that walking gage singled out as mm-hmm. one that he said he should stop and he's yeah. an NH, was a former nhl he goalie wasn't so like only, okay yeah. So if you say you should stop that one and the other two, like any layman could say, okay, you should probably have those. And then we'll go get your opinion. And we'll get on to the last one, one before we get on the last one. But yeah, like, honestly, I I'm in the same boat just from my own eyes, right. As yeah. a fan, this is one that I say, yeah, you, you don't want to see it, but it happens a bit of a bouncer. And again, it was on the power play for Detroit. Right. Yeah. So this is the one that is the most excusable. In my mm-hmm. mind, but yeah, you're agreed. right. It, I'm not. I'm not an NHL goalie. I'm not seeing any of these pucks through through the mask or anything like that. So I trust. Uh, I trust Joachim Gage. And like I mean, and it's, then it's a tough call. So let's look at the fourth one then. Oli Mata from 40 feet out on the on the ice, right? Like that can't go in as well. Right through the five hole. Like yes, he had time to track it. He had time to get set more than enough time uh and, and and nothing came from that right so to me that's a that's also an unacceptable goal so so that's why this the loss of this point like the the the, the, the fact is they came back and made a game of it right and, and on the flip side of this Vili Huso played phenomenal he played phenomenal and one more thing on the modigal yeah it was unacceptable also because of the timing right yes this was right after Nuge had tapped home that beautiful behind the net pass from McDavid but, amazing yeah, stuff I'm sorry the momentum right it's an absolute momentum killer when you give up that amount of goal just right off the face off dot and most people would say like he's shooting it from distance yes it's a bit of a rocket but it's not screened or anything you should have that 100 mm-hmm. percent. I, I i i i kind of in the same boat as you with when it comes to that goal i think i think there was a, this is a game where you can place the blame on the goal you don't like doing it often i try to to stay away from it. I think we've done more than our fair share of it this season, but yeah, this is a game you can kind of pinpoint and say, okay, if you get average goaltending, you come out with the point. Like the Oilers played by all accounts, an excellent game. There were a number of chances. They didn't finish like a Vander Kane in the slot, Warren Fogel at a number, Ryan McLeod, kind of the same complaint as I have had with Connor earlier. Like, please, for the love of God, just shoot the puck. Like I get it. You can make, you guys can make, you're so talented. You can make phenomenal plays as hell away McLeod Fogel line. But like at some point, just tap, just Swired. shoot it on net. Huso was stopping everything. Right. Uh, yeah. So, so and yeah, let's, let's talk about that now. Right. So this was a night and it, it's a very typical Oilers type of game, right? Where your big guns are going to do a lot of the work. Mm-hmm. They did three goals out of the four tonight. Yep. Derek and you Ryan. Have Derek Ryan. Exactly. Derek Ryan just comes up clutch. He's had an excellent season. Great depth scoring. One in addition. Uh, when I, I did not think he would be able to be this good, this productive, um, this late into his career. Uh, obviously, very happy to be proven wrong. Brian's been an excellent addition. He can actually drive play. The Oilers' bottom six for the first time since like 16, 17 is actually a plus in goal differential. Well, McDavid yeah. and Dressel aren't on the ice. So the the youth uh, immersion in the bottom six, plus guys like Ryan, Clem Cost, and I mean, uh, that, that was the line, right? Cost and Ryan Pugliarvi, and they were good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sometimes it, again, it's not all high like, draft pedigree. You exactly, don't have to have high like, draft pedigree. No, this, like, again, this game, it's a really like weird game. Hyman himself generated over one expected goal. Nuge had just under one, but he scored two goals. Like, the Oilers controlled, but for, like, besides, like, the 15 minutes or 10 minutes in the first, they controlled the entire pace of play in this game the red wings were f- hanging by the seat of their pants especially in the last 10 15 minutes of the oh, third yeah. like please just don't score and Huso did everything he could the others just missed the red wings got really lucky that's why again not too upset um 
OT I mean, is kind of a crapshoot, but yeah. It's no. always a crapshoot. And mm -hmm. uh, Mickinator, great point. What happened to the success in the McDry years of OT, right? Like, it's it weird. used to be three on three. McDavid and Drysdale out there? Yeah, cap it off. It's an immediate win. Well, when, when Eric Carlson comes here, just <laughs> wait until he's on in on an OT with McDavid and Drysdale. There was it was kind of, it was a little weird because like the, McDavid and Drysdale. And again, I was watching this on my phone, so I might be wrong, but they looked gassed later on in OT, right? Like just yeah. gassed. Well, and they it didn't was a have it. It was a strange overtime, right? Mm -hmm. There were a, a lot more icings than mm -hmm. usually happens in overtime. Overtime usually is a very possession-driven affair. You know, there's so much open ice that if you don't see what you like, you just skate back and hold on to the puck. Yeah. But there were two or three icings mm -hmm. in a really short span of time during that overtime, which definitely gassed guys. And it showed when there were quite a few two-on-ones. Oh, yeah. Uh, Kane obviously, Bouchard. Kane Bouchard got two cracks at it. Just mm -hmm. couldn't get it done, right? Like, it goes back to what you're trying to say. They were passing it into the net yeah. instead of just going for it. Take a shot, see if you can get a rebound afterwards, or if it's going off to the boards, you can recollect, maintain possession. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Julian in the chat asked an interesting question, and we'll get to that in a bit. So I just want to point out that I'm saving that for a little later. Um, one thing I wanted to say, and I meant to point this out when we were talking about the goals, but for me, so the first two goals, I believe the pairing on the ice is Broberg Bouchard. I thought Bouchard was excellent tonight. The play he made on, I, I believe it was the Oilers' uh, third goal uh, in the neutral zone was phenomenal. His play in the mm -hmm. offensive zone, walking the blue line, the confidence and the poise that he showed with the puck was something that no other Oilers defenseman could come even close to. He was, I thought he was the Oilers' best defenseman tonight um he, he was excellent but like but to point but to, to say what i'm what i want to say is he's on the ice for those two absolutely horrible unlucky goals against right that are he has nothing to do with but because those went in the net he gets a minus he gets the the negative course he gets everything his goals four percentage goes down his pdo goes like he's yeah. just so unlucky and it's coming back to bite him in the ass in terms of his perception by the fan base but like those two goals are prime example of literally out of his control like you just expect the goalie to make the save. He couldn't make the save. And because of that, when you go back and look at the numbers later, if someone goes to point out something, it's going to look bad on Evan Bouchard when it's not Evan Bouchard's fault in the slightest. And I just when it's lost in the aggregate, you're excellent. right. He made a play uh, on the on the McDavid, or the second Eugene Hopkins goal too, just to get it to Connor McDavid. It was excellent. And I thought Evan Bouchard and, and Philip Broberg tonight played really well. Kulak also, I thought was really good. It's that CC nurse pairing, man, that just gives up way too many chances. It's it's rough, right? Because you're right, like, especially for Broberg. I mean, this mm -hmm. is his first year where he's become an NHL mainstay. And you have two that go off your skate, like it's not good for your stats, but he's doing the right thing. He's trying to hold a guy back from crashing the net. Like all of those are the right play to make in that instant, but it just goes off off a, off a skate and it's an unlucky bounce. So mm -hmm. I feel like you're absolutely right. This is pretty damaging to the young guys in terms of their stats and, and their confidence. It's been happening all year for Bouchard. The guys that had yeah. a stroke of luck, right? Like his shooting percentage is through the floor. Everything's just gone as wrong as it can. But <laughs> his play, his actual puck skills, his actual poise that he's shown with the puck. Yeah, again, and everyone's going to say, oh, he lacks urgency. He lacks a little bit of complacentness in the defensive zone. What, Shut up. what is urgency? Yeah, I don't even understand. You're right. What is right. urgency? You can you can contemplate this as okay. If you say he lacks urgency, the mm -hmm. flip opposite. If you're if you're turning from a negative light to a positive light, he's calm and collected. Those are two sides of the same coin, right? Lacking urgency. If you're if you're gassed up, if you are absolutely juiced and you're out there doing random movements that you don't need like that doesn't help anyone either no. so i i really don't like the term you know lack of urgency like that's what you want to be around calm. the oilers twitter sphere right though you've yeah. i'm sure you've seen it. it's a oh but sure he doesn't make plays fast enough he doesn't sense danger fast enough but that's if that's just how he is as a player and he's he consistently leads the goal the oilers in expected goals when I mean, you have a defenseman that can drive that for you especially with the bottom six that you have uh it's really impressive so 
yeah, he's someone that you want to keep around, and he's been really good despite, you know, plays in, that happen that aren't necessarily his fault. Uh, another thing that someone pointed out in chat was Thomas Schwinn. Dry settle is obviously awesome, but some errant passing lately, just too many giveaways. Totally agree. There were some plays like Detroit had a two on one, I think late in the second, early in the third, that was just a Leon pass to Kane. It was complete, it was picked off, and Detroit got an odd man rush out of it. What do you think's well, up I, with Leon since the All Star break, really? I wanted to answer this question because it came up earlier from Docky. Uh, mm -hmm. just didn't get a chance to, but yeah, Dry Seidel, he does have some sort of illness, like it's non COVID. I, I would agree. There's something it was noted. That's why he wasn't in the practice. Uh, I don't know why Kane wasn't in the practice, but Dreisaitl had some sort of illness. So it's the same thing probably that Vinny DeHarnay was so, taken out for for tonight. It's probably a flu or something like that. Yeah, so, there's definitely a flu going around the Oilers, like for sure. We know that for a fact. We do know that it takes a long time to heal from high ankle sprains. You can come back and you can play, but when you have an injury that severe, it's going to take a long time. Like dry saddle is this entire season has, he's been putting up the points, but he's not been 100%. He mm -hmm. might be playing 80, 85%. One thing I've noticed, and I haven't seen anyone point this out. When you see dry saddle as the, the one in the offensive zone as like the first, the first four checker there. Um, and again, not next to those guys. So forgive me if I explain this stuff wrong. But when he's the guy who's responsible for applying pressure and he's the first forward down low, you see he doesn't pressure the defender or the guy on the wall. What he does is he kind of stands still, he puts his stick up in the air, and he waits for them to make a pass, and he bats it down out of the air. Every time without fail. Watch Drysdale. He's the only player I've ever seen that does this. He does not apply pressure. He gets close, tries to force a pass, and knock it down, get a steal. There's no, like, trying to lift the stick, applying pressure, physical, like... None of that. And, and, and you I, worry, is this something, me, is that me. something there? Oh, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I, well, I was just going to say, it, it seems like it, it, it reminds me a lot of how he played during the Calgary series. Because I think that's the first time I want to say that I noticed it, right? When he couldn't move and he was just trying to use his stick and try and be productive in any way possible without moving. So to me, I believe it's, he's just, he's still feeling the, effect. again, not, I don't want to say he's like hurt, but he's like, banged up from that injury and the healing will take a long time especially with a short off season and whatnot but i'll let you jump in i think it's exactly that mm -hmm. so what you're seeing is dry sidle when he's on a guy right when mm -hmm. he's right there doing pressure he's a big body he's a heavy body and again he has a giant paddle of a stick that he can use to fish pucks and get it loose right he's not really doing it potentially because it's both a mental and a physical thing. That's how he kind of got hurt, right? I mean, I think it was Mikey Anderson that kind of brought yeah. him down, you know, yeah. twisted his his ankle. That's a situation where, you know, you don't want to re-aggregate, re-aggravate the injury doing mm -hmm. the same kind of tussle. Yeah. And he's you've been right. He's still effective. Well, he's, he's learned how to be effective. Exactly, exactly. Not playing he's, physical. Exactly. He's figured out a new way. He in the playoffs against Calgary and Colorado, he learned a new way that he could utilize his skill set at, at hockey. And it's almost like it's changed his game this year. And I see people talking about load management or give dry a maintenance <laughs> day or a day here. The, the type of thing I'm talking about, this high ankle sprain, this is like years to yeah. eventually get back to 100 percent, right like well, this is what we also thought kane would take kane's mm -hmm. obviously not 100 percent with his wrist yet it's impossible for someone to be you know 100 percent from having sliced tendons in his wrist yeah. in four months so he's playing a little bit banged up dry saddle looks like he's and, also and, playing and, a little bit banged also up. also know from what went from when he sat out of practice uh I, I can't remember who it was but they also said he has an upper body injury too that he is dealing with something oh. up top. So he's banged up all over. It's not necessarily like he doesn't have one thing that's, he doesn't have like a broken arm that's going to keep him out four to six weeks. I think he just has a number of little injuries. Nagging he might be, he got sick. And then he has something that happened to him, you know, six months ago now, or almost a year ago now, I guess, just under a year ago, that really was a really serious injury. That And, and think about it, how, like, we don't know this, and I'm not a doctor, and maybe this isn't something I should be speculating on, but when you get a high ankle sprain and you force yourself through grueling two rounds of playoff hockey, like, is there any potential? He may, and I understand why I did. I'm not trying to say that he did anything bad, but it, he could have maybe he made it a little bit worse. And right. that's why it's just taking longer to heal. 
which is understandable. And I, th- but to me, I, I think that's what it is with Leon. I honestly think you're you're right. It's definitely that injury. I I haven't heard about the upper body injury. That's a little bit new to me, yeah. but. Drysaddle, he's always looked like a lazy skater. He's always been a guy that likes to see the play, react to the play. He's never been like an energy guy that that goes in and crashes and bangs the body. This yeah. is just him taking that to a whole new level. Yeah. And sometimes it looks a little bit silly when he's trying to swat down pucks and he yeah. just absolutely misses it. But you've noticed that, right? Yeah, it's exactly, it's happened yeah. a lot. It's every game. If you just look at him, I'm like, I'm like, it's just weird because it's something new, right? Yeah. And yeah, it's it's something I've noticed. Uh, um, oh, where was I going to go with that? One thing I did want to say. Uh, oh, oh, what I was going to say about Leon is, to me, I'm not worried about Leon though. The thing is, and and I expect Leon with Leon when the playoffs come around and we're in the last ten games of the regular season and that new addition comes in at the trade deadline his game is going to pick up. He, like, it's one thing to put up this performance against a Detroit or a Philly, but when he, when I know he, he's a big game player. He always yeah. shows up when it matters. And I'm not worried. Like I, it, it's going to be a tale of two Leons. Mark my words. When <laughs> the puck drops or the series of round one in April, whoever they're playing Seattle, LA, I don't know, Colorado, whatever. It, it, Leon will look like a completely different player. That's what I fully expect, and I, I believe that will happen. Yeah, so. I, I if this podcast episode was uh, was titled any differently than it would, this this episode would be titled "The Tale of Two Oilers." Mm-hmm. Uh, so honestly, a hundred percent, the Oilers as a team will get up for big games. We've seen that happen with Tampa. I'm thinking it's going to happen with Boston. That's one of the biggest tests that are coming up. But you're right. Like Mm -hmm. when the playoffs come and at this point in time, there's no doubting it will come. Mm -hmm. Like the Oilers are going to be in the playoffs. When it's playoffs time, they will get into it. And you're going to start seeing a whole nother level from guys like Dreisaitl, guys like Hyman, guys like Nuge, and by God, guys like McDavid. Mm-hmm. If he he's at ninety nine points right now, right? He's shame he didn't get a hundred. It's a shame he didn't get a hundred, but he's at ninety nine points. I don't know what this next level is going to be like for this guy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. He's he's cruising. He, I guarantee, I'm gonna guarantee you right now as well that it, he will hit 150 points. Uh, we've been rolling for a little bit here. We've obviously got some trade deadline questions in the chat, so let's hit those. But I just want to say, there's 48 of you guys watching now. We only got 22 likes. Our like goal day we set at 36. If you guys want to hit, go ahead and smash the like button. We're gonna get to the uh, questions in chat. The first question that we saw, and it's way back up there, so I'm not gonna pull it up. I'm just gonna go back off what I saw off memory. Uh, would you be interested? This was from a Wings fan, I assume. So I'm kind of shocked they even said this. Would you be interested in trading Jesse Pugliarvi in a pick for Tyler Batuzzi retained? Uh, or are we saving Pugliarvi for a Carlson Chikrin deal? What What are your thoughts on that? And I'll give my thoughts. Honestly, it doesn't seem like Pugliarvi is the major piece in any of those deals for, for Chikrin, for Carlson. He's in it for cap reasons. Yeah, he's right? salary. He's p- it's purely a cap dump. I would welcome if you're able to get him and value him as an asset instead of a cap dump. I think there are I teams that do welcome. value him as an asset because we there's a reason he hasn't gone on waivers yet. He's he's a project, right? It's one of those dicey yes. things where like Costin is a great example, right? He went down through waivers and no one claimed him. So totally. from that first point in pick. time, mm-hmm. first round pick. I mean, not as high as Pooley-RV, No, But sure. he was, uh, I think he was also an MVP at the World Juniors, just like Pooley-RV. Like, they, there's, there are similarities. They're different type of players, but I understand what you're saying with that. Yeah. Uh, what I would say in regards to Tyler Bertuzzi, Elliot Friedman speculated that Tyler Bertuzzi is a Canadian citizen on an American, on a work visa in the United States, right? He can come back and forth between the United States and Canada because of that American work visa, but he is a Canadian national. So if he were to play for a Canadian team, he would then lose that American work visa. Now the U.S. government still requires foreigners who come into the country to be vaccinated. So even though it seems like nobody cares... Is Tyler Bertuzzi allowed to play for a Canadian team and freely travel between the United States and Canada without quarantine? No one knows the answer to that. Just for that even thing alone, I don't think he's worth the um, 
all all the fuss in that regard, right? Well, the the hope is if you're if you're OEG and you're mm-hmm. gonna make these moves, the hope is that you talk to the Canadian government. The hope is that you talk to immigration if, if, and figure out what's his status. If right? Eric Carlson wasn't vaccinated, I I would be on the phone <laughs> with Trudeau right now asking, and, and Joe Biden, we'd have a full on press conference. I get it, yeah, get a trilateral agreement yes. going. But Tyler Bertuzzi, he's got two goals this year, really does nothing for me. I understand he's a 30 goal scorer in the past. He's not worth the hype. There's many people I would target before him. Uh so yeah, like if he's your last and to me, he screams a Dallas, a Vegas, a Tampa Bay. Some I I I think, yeah, maybe Ken Holland likes him. Maybe the others have him on their trade list, but I think he's way down there. I don't think that's someone they're targeting. I the Oilers. Are going for a splash, a big name, and yeah, Tyler Bertuzzi's good, but Tyler Bertuzzi ain't no big name. Well, here's the thing, right? That's where the second part of that question comes in. If he's retained, I I think Bertuzzi, uh, he's at like four point something, like a four point seven or something like that. Yeah like you're gonna have to make it enticing for the Oilers we're not gonna spend extra cap room in order to fit Bertuzzi in if you retain you take away Pugliarvi's three he ends up getting a little bit cheaper that might help in making a big name move uh, later on during the trade deadline to me there's something suspicious going on and we (laughs) talked about it a little bit there are shenanigans you cannot just have a healthy player on long-term injury reserve. Tyler Yamamoto was eligible to come off of long-term injury reserve for the Sunday game against Montreal. A week before that game, all accounts, that was the target. That's when he was coming off. He was skating. He's been skating for like three weeks. He was ready to go. And I know you can say it's a concussion. It's hard to track, blah, 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 whatever. He was ready to go on Sunday. He wants to go. He's a hockey player. He's in the NHL. He wants to play. We end Do up we know pushing... for sure it was a concussion? Like No, it's speculation. But it's. I think it's all. I don't think it's been flat out said by the Oilers, but I'm pretty sure that's the consensus agreement. And it is a concussion. Anyways, it's a head injury, upper body. I don't know. doesn't mm-hmm. matter. Ready to go. Then they push it out till Wednesday because they, there's something's weird. They don't want to put Pugliarvi on waivers, even though all we're hearing is Jesse Pugliarvi is going on waivers, right? Wednesday comes along. All the tweets in practice are, oh, wow, he looks fantastic. He's hitting guys way harder than you should He's, practice. Yeah. Flying around, buzzing around, buzzsaw. But then comes out after, oh, no, he's still hurt. He's not playing tonight. So Jesse didn't go on waivers yesterday. Uh, there, I didn't think they, were, they were, would have put him on today. Now – Essentially, if they don't place Jesse Pugliarvi on waivers tomorrow, or Yanmark, but they seem to love Yanmark, or Derek Ryan, but Derek Ryan's really good. They they love Devin Shore, and he's been up and down like totally. That's fair. That's fair. But so essentially, we. But the thing is, for months it's been Pugliarvi's going on waivers, right? right? We've heard that everywhere. So if they don't place Jesse on waivers tomorrow by noon Mountain. They, they don't they will be over the salary cap if they activate Kyler Yamamoto for Friday's game by the time Jesse would have cleared for Friday yeah. so by that that either means someone else has to go on LTIR which who would go on LTIR everyone's healthy everyone's healthy I mean like you can't say Costin's injured no, and even if Costin was on LTIR doctor, it's not enough a doctor needs to sign off you can't just say uh uh Devin Shore you got a knee injury now that's not <laughs> well, yeah, how Devin, Devin Shore is already in, time, like, exactly. in the AHL so. Every, that was just the first name again my right and Jean-Pierre. it doesn't matter he, a doctor <laughs> has to sign off on someone going on LTIR and that's a medical thing you can't mess around no. like, they don't want to mess around with that it could affect their medical license so yeah the, 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 Pugliarvi needs to go on waivers. Somebody needs to go on LTIR. If Pugliarvi is not on waivers, to me, they have to make a trade. Like, that. that's the only that's, option, right? That's, like that's the reason. And we heard today from Jason Greger that the Oilers gave an offer to San Jose for Eric Carlson. Carlson. Now, the offer could have been a second-round pick, and, <laughs> and a, you know, like, an offer could be anything. But the fact that I saw in chat someone mentioned about Evander Kane and Eric Carlson's beef. Well, apparently Ken Holland already had asked Evander Kane, and Evander Kane is happy and more than happy to welcome Eric Carlson to the team. And he told Ken Holland that. Apparently, um, who did I saw? I saw Sharks fans uh, online talking about how that was just a made-up thing in the media, and Eric Carlson and Evander Kane are actually fine. It was a whole thing. We don't know what's true. We don't know what's false. And, and again, it's all speculative. I'm gonna go with what Kane said. And clearly, Carlson is into it too because 
They know that he's willing to come here. Something happened at the All-Star game. There's a reason he they McDavid and Dressel only played with Eric Carlson. Yeah, and the other thing is, again, Carlson has a no-trade clause. So no this is – or no-move clause, yeah. So all of this is It's a waste of time, right? If, if that's a no, I'm not going to Edmonton for whatever reason, ex- personnel, yes. climate, whatever. Guaranteed he's already said that he would be willing to waive if the Sharks got a right deal. It's not like he requested a trade. But again, why yeah. would Edmonton put all this time and ask their players and submit offers if they didn't know that Carlson was already willing to waive his no tr- no move clause, right? And Mike Greer would, like, the first thing you do would be, hey, uh, they want you. And mm-hmm. to be honest, we're rebuilding and we we don't really want you. That's the thing. <laughs> They're already retaining on Burns. They plan on being bad for at least the next four years. I think they're retaining on Burns for three more years. Yeah, they, they are. want to lose, if you're, especially if you're trading your best player by a mile, Timo Meyer at the deadline, who's 26. Like, you're going to trade Meyer and you're going to hang on to this defenseman who could single-handedly still will you up the standings. Like, if you're planning on be bad, you got to go all out and try and get the best draft picks you can, right? And the fact that four months ago, this contract was unmovable, and now we're willing to trade, you know, ass, actual tangible assets for it. Used to be San a negative. Jose should bite the bullet they'll save money even though they are they'll save money on what they're paying carl they'll they'll pay him to play against them but at the same they time be bad. you're not going to be yeah you're not going to be paying a guy who's actively going against what your organization wants exactly it'll he's 20 million times better than anything tyson Berry is like this is a top 10 defenseman of all time he's won the norris twice he's gonna win the norris again this year he is unbelievable with the puck he has more five on five points than Connor McDavid. He has more five on five goals than Leon Dreisidel. Like <laughs> he's not a power play guy. That's not what this would be for. He would facilitate. He would do instrumental things at driving the play five on five. He would change how Edmund. He's averaging twenty five minutes a night on San Jose. He's more he's effective fine. when he is off the ice. They're a they're a piece of themselves. He he carries that team head over heels and. Yeah, it just makes Honestly, so many sense in so many words. San Jose needs to take the golden ticket. They have to get out of jail for free card. They're not going to get a better offer. I know it's hard to figure out in season. They are mm-hmm. not going to get a better offer in terms of assets than they are right now. And here's a question from Jacob. Do you guys think Carlson digs Edmonton more than other teams? Yes. I think the issue is Carlson has no other options. <laughs> no mean, yeah. other team wants to trade for him. And yeah. it's either you stay in San Jose for a rebuild or you come up to snowy Edmonton. He's, Actually, I, it's pretty nice yeah. in Edmonton right I've now. Heard him, mm-hmm. And um, you, you try and challenge for a, a Stanley Cup with yeah. Connor, Leon, Nuge, and Hyman. And yeah, I've, I've heard him on multiple podcasts. Wants to win, wants to win, wants to win. His wife is from Canada. He's from a small town in northern Sweden. I think players are barely in Edmonton anyways they're on the road for half the season and then they're you know in Edmonton for 50 or 100 days in the year 150 whatever and then they can go to their summer house in LA or Florida or wherever he wants right like he wants to win this this for some reason right and it might be again if you want to get into conspiracy theory territory here's me going into my conspiracy territory theory Ken Holland was able to bring in a guy from an organization that couldn't hold on to him because he he already said i want to leave there were no other options for him to go to ken holland overpaid a little bit he, we yeah duncan Keith. okay i was <laughs> sorry i was confused i thought i'm a hymen for a bit i no. was like what he well, hymen had options right hymen yes, had options that's true, but that's true, there that's true. were no other options for keith right mm-hmm. and we overpaid for him overpaid for him and at the time, everyone was saying, okay, this is a horrible deal for Ken Holland. Unless Duncan Keith decides to retire this year, which would then give the Oilers this much cap space and potentially negative cap space for this particular part of the contract. You know what? You get Carlson for four more seasons after this. I'm trusting in the Kenny Holland magic. I'm trusting in this illuminati whatever you want to say figure it out yeah year year three maybe he decides to hang up the skates and like go build a house with cleft again 
thirty-eight percent of Carl of Carlson's contract retained is exactly Barry and Pooley going out the door. Tyson Barry is nowhere close to anything that uh that Eric Carlson would be. I understand he's close to the room. That's what we have Devin Shore for. Clearly, Connor Connor McDavid is not an idiot. He knows. <laughs> how much everyone makes. He knows yeah. what everyone's role is on the team. He wouldn't have asked Ken Holland for Eric Carlson. They like We know that he, Holland has spoken to Drasaddle, McDavid, and Kane about Eric Carlson. About a puck-moving defenseman. Uh, Eric hmm. Carlson. It is Eric Carlson. <laughs> I wonder no, who that it, could no, be. it's Eric Carlson. <laughs> we know that he's spoken. McDavid understands that salary needs to go. Like yeah. He says dollar out, do, dollar and dollar, dollar out to the media. He says it's the players, too. I can guarantee you that, right? So Mike David knows when he asks that, okay, if it's big, like, I, I, I can tell you that I can guarantee that Connor McDavid will be okay with Tyson Berry leaving, but if it makes them That's better, better, like this puts them over the top, this gets them better. You keep, you do, you keep, absolutely the one player you cannot move in this deal is Evan Bouchard. I think that would be regressing backwards. And I think that would be, if, 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 if it was Evan Bouchard for Eric Carlson straight up, I wouldn't do it. Yeah. That's a bad idea, but here's the thing too, right? Mm-hmm. Bouchard is like you said he's he's got some really unlucky stats this season if you're trading him now you are trading him at a low yeah you you are tr- you're getting Carlson who's at ride and high yeah but because of the lack of other competitors yeah. in the space for him and, it drives his dr- trade and, market down a little bit mm-hmm. and then Bouchard is low you don't want to use your low value chips right now you want to yeah. wait for them to come up a little bit mm-hmm. and, and d- just a quick side tangent, if you'll allow it, because mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. Mikey Anderson, I mean, in L.A., he signed an eight-year extension tonight, for, yep. or today, for 4.25, something like yep. that. Decently strong defensive defenseman. You can clearly see with with Bouchard's season being the way that it is, you can see that that might yeah. be an option I, if you I, make the oh, cap if that's work. an option, I would sign him yesterday. You want Bouchard Ooh. and you want... Uh, Jim Jacob in the chat. No, no, no. Bouchard Robert. is near untouchable. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. I, like just like because again, if you have two guys, a nurse making a nine and Carlson making a seven or an eight, you got to have the two guys making nine nine hundred grand. You can't have yeah. all these guys, right? That's why Barry's got to go. And if and if the it's other Yamo thing is as the salary instead of Pooley RV, if that's who they want. So yeah. be it. You know what I mean? Barry um, is also going to be trading at a, another high, right? I, like I'd move Barry. He's Barry's, a high. Barry's a hot asset, and hey, you know what? Bam, you trade him to someone Enjoy. out east. I I don't care. Like you trade him to the Rangers if they want him. Just give him away. Mm-hmm. They'll do their thing in the in the Eastern Conference. If we meet him in the final, we meet him in the final. There's yeah. a one in eight chance of that happening. And, and everyone talked about oh, Duncan Keith was so instrumental in Evan Bouchard's learning and development. Is there no one better for Evan Bouchard to learn from than Eric Carlson? Eric Carlson? Like, oh my God, talk about insanity! I think he is your Kale McCarr. He's a little bit old. He's obviously a lot a bit older, but uh, he, he, that just puts you over the top. That shows Connor. Connor asked. Connor receives. So when Connor comes to UFA at the end of his contract and he says, you know what, Ken Holland, when I want something, I got it. I was treated like royalty here. I'm going to stay here for the remainder of my career. That's why I want that. I don't think if if, if you get Connor McDavid, you know, a, 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 a dead Jonathan Taves and an Oli Mata that he's like, wow. Kennel, we're, I'm getting everything I could ever want here. I don't think that does it for him. I think you need to show these two guys that you are committed to winning it. You understand what they do for your team. And I heard, and again, this is a story that Tom Gazzola told later today, but went earlier today, when the Oilers were in like 2013 and they had just, they missed the playoffs, you know, six, seven years in a row. And they just, they were in eighth place. They beat up on Calgary and the trade deadline rolled around. And who did Steve Tambellini go out and get? But he traded for Jared Smithson. And apparently... The entire Oilers core was pissed. They're like, that's the help you got us. And then they went on to lose like 10 games in a row, right? So when you bring it, the boost that it will provide, it's just like firing a coach. You bring this guy in, you go balls to the wall. Who knows what's happened? The future is now. You don't know. There could be injuries in the future. There could be tricks. You never know what's going to happen. Your fact is you're good now. You have a good team. You have a million pieces that you've saved. Make the deal. Carlson or Chikrin, I'm not picky. One right. or the others. If To me, to be honest with you, if it is not one of those guys, I'll be pretty upset. Like I consider that a yeah. fail of a deadline. And I, that might sound ridiculous. I might sound people think, Oh, you're an idiot. That's crazy. There's a million good defensive defensemen out there. No. Like here's, to me, here's the thing. You right? gotta be it, the, get the best guy. 
there's a lot of speculation but that's that's the whole realm of sports right mm -hmm. the fact that we have a term called cinderella story if everything went by the books by paper you know what you don't have to play the game you know the whole reason why we go through these exercises is because you try and succeed you try and win you could build for the future, but honestly, if you're the Oilers right now, the Western Conference has never looked more open. Yeah. Unless Colorado somehow has like a heal all potion and everyone comes back, the Oilers are probably the best team right now. Even like Vegas, Seattle, you know, they're very streaky. Vegas is banged up as well. Like the Oilers right now, they're healthy. They can get even stronger. And by God, it would be amazing to see mm -hmm. either Chikorin yeah. or Carlson, someone who is just an absolute offensive godsend yeah. playing with McDavid and Dreisaitl. That's yeah. just a pure entertainment Absolutely. factor, too. Absolutely. I agree. You're bringing, in the, you're bringing in the potential Norris winner this season. I don't know if that's ever been done in NHL history before. Maya says, who would you pair Carlson with if he comes to us? We'll talk about that. Maybe we got we're we're running a little bit long here, so let's save that for the next show because I'm sure there will still be you, rampant speculation. You know what would be fun? What if we just give our lines and then y'all can just tweet at us? <laughs> we'll we'll drop it and then we'll just go. No explanation. You guys tweet at us if you think we're in idiots. If you think we're insane for making mm -hmm. pairings, who would you pair with, Eric Carlson? Me? Oh, Kulak. I think Kulak would be a great. Same here. Yeah, yeah. Same I think Kulak here. Works perfect. I would still do Nurse. New... I would have Nurse Bouchard, Kulak, Carlson, Barry. Or not Barry, sorry, CC Broberg. Uh, and then that wasn't uh, that painful, just was it? Lastly, no, lastly, and, I, and you could say here in a second. Uh, some stranger says the chicken ship has sailed. He hasn't been traded yet. LA clearly is not like they have an offer in for him, but uh, it's it's no greater than anyone else's. There's he's not close to being traded anywhere right now. He still is anyone's thing. I was listening to Bob Stoffer on the on the six thirty check free game show before the puck dropped tonight, and. He, like some, you can make the argument, and I can see this argument that Jacob Chikrin is a better stylistic fit for the Edmonton Oilers than Eric Carlson, and I'll absolutely listen to that. But the, by no means has the chips the ship sailed. So. If it isn't faxed into the NHL's head office, yeah, it's not done. The not ship is not sailed. Mm -hmm. All right, like you mentioned, we are going to wrap the show there. Next game is Friday. It's a seven Mountain Time puck drop. The Rangers are going to be visiting, and uh, you and I are going to have a little bit of a special guest. Oh yes, we yeah yeah I forgot we will. I forgot I got to <laughs> message the guy. He's been tweeting that. He's been tweeting me. He's been DMing me. Uh yeah, it's Adrian. Adrian, Adrian Fernando yes. and famously uh, today he decided to take a nap instead of watching the game uh, yeah. until the t until the score was tied. So he'll be on next show with us. Until then, that's it for us. And if Eric Car if Eric Carlson's an Oiler by next stream, I think you and I will both be absolutely, happier. absolutely. <laughs> I'll be ecstatic. Zach, where can they find you? You can find me at zwheel97 on Twitter. Uh, Dennis yourself dennis dennis lee yeg on twitter that's it for us tonight yeah thank you so much for watching thank you for all the red wings fans in here showing some <laughs> love and i know it was eastern time so it's a it's a little bit of a late night for you guys thanks for staying up with us mgd mickinator jacob dacky some stranger uh julian who left earlier have a great rest of your night guys Bye bye Powered by Sports Interaction, Canada Sportsbook.